that day, 21st of March. My place is to have a meeting venue to move to the prof's place. The members started to flock in in my house. We didn't know our destiny. We are meeting appointment that we have made with history. So we made that appointment to walk with him up to the, to the finish. In the dawning hours of Monday morning, the 21st March 1960, Robert Sobukwe, known to many as Prof, left his home in Mufulo, Soweto, and began the five kilometer walk to the Orlando police station to personally put into action his nationwide call for a decisive, non-violent campaign against the past laws. As president of the Pan-Africanist Congress, Sobuku had called on all black South Africans on that day to leave their past books at home, walk to the nearest police station, and demand arrest. From Prof's place, and then we moved down at the corner, where we meet many other members. I remember it very well. I took him as far as Chabalala supermarket store and continued to my clinic. It's not far from Mfulo. I went there on foot and they left for Orlando police station. The first group at Chabalala store, we moved from there to Dube. Dube, we find another group. We took them with us. Where is YMCA today? We meet another group. We stream up to Sepanem to Ping's house. We find another group there. We move up to the bridge to Orlando. When we came at the plantation, next to the Orlando police station, you find the Orlando East branch was waiting for us there. They've joined us. So we moved toward the police station. When we came to Orlando police station, so we said, this is the core of my men, because we were a really disciplined group. That's why evening when we come here to them, we told them that we surrender for arrest to you, because we can no longer carry the bus. We have had it enough. Enough is enough. So we said, gentlemen, let's sit down. We all sit, and then they walk back to the police station. After a few minutes, then comes the SP's cars. They took Sobogo, Libalo, and the region. And in the evening, we read in the papers about Sharpville massacre. Oh, they were really sad. It really broke their hearts. For Sobukwe, the 21st March 1960 began as any other day. By nightfall, his actions had determined the course of history in South Africa, and the police shootings at Sharpville had emblazoned indelibly the profile of apartheid on the consciousness of the world. Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, the youngest of four surviving children, was born in the township of Masizaki outside Hrafreinet on the 5th December 1924. It was a hard and simple life. His mother, Angelina, had never been to school, while his father, Hubert, forced by circumstances to leave after Standard 5, was passionately driven to ensure the education of his children. There was no electricity or running water, and the children slept on the floor. But with his meager income, Robert's father made sure that he brought books into the home and encouraged his children to read. Their father, a religious man. For Robert and his siblings, church attendance on Sunday was obligatory at the Township Methodist Church Mission. During the week, this same venue provided for their formal primary school education. 
With no secondary schooling for blacks in Graf Renet, Robert Sobuko waited for two years before obtaining the necessary financial assistance to go to Hilltown, a Methodist educational institution near Fort Beaufort. He was the closest friend I had at school. He and I would always be together. You see, he and I had common interests. When he got to Hilltown in 1940, we met at the library. So we were going through the books there, whatever was available, and he said, ah, oh, you're also interested in reading? I said, yes. So our friendship started then. Robert was a voracious reader. He was very keen on English literature, particularly poetry. I remember one that he really loved was uh, Gray's Elegy. And there are those two lines there that he always would sort of quote to me. You know, where he would say, full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air. Now, he loved those two lines. And in the classics, he loved Charles Dickens, particularly A Tale of Two Cities. Also, Baroness Oxy's uh, Scarlet Pimpernel. I mean, these were in the 40s. And um, in biography, he preferred to read the biographies of the chaps in America because he felt that uh, this is where these people started fighting slavery. He was that sort of man. He had a lot of empathy with other people. Very sensitive and uh, the sort of chap who would not tolerate injustice. If he felt that somebody was uh, being exploited for one reason or another, Robert would come in and say, now look, this is not fair. This chap is small. This chap is not as strong as you are. Now, why do that? Why don't you take someone your own size? Now, if, if you had seen him, you know, he was a well-built chap. Five feet ten, five feet nine, tall, broad shoulders. And he kept himself in very good physical condition because he was a great tennis player, a very fine tennis player. He, he was that type of chap. In other words, he was a chap who was out and out and out for justice. He liked music and um, he was also, um, curious enough, a Christian. At Hilltown we had two main services on a Sunday. Now, Robert wouldn't miss any of these two. In fact, he was a member of the Hilltown Church Choir. He loved church music particularly. And uh, of course he and I loved the classics like Mozart, uh, Brahms, that sort of thing. We, we really enjoyed that sort of music. At Hilltown, it was a mixed school, uh, boys and girls. He and I were called Stripper. Now, a Stripper is a chap who has no girlfriend. See, now these fellows, men, they're always discussing books and that sort of thing, discussing this and that. They are hopeless, man. So he was like that at Hilltown. I don't remember a single woman who was his girlfriend. Who was Robert's girlfriend at Hilltown? No, we didn't have any girlfriends. Robert was very articulate. You know, the school always had a farewell function at the end of the year. And Robert was the chap the students elected to represent the students at that function. Look, his language was meticulous. He was really very well respected because the man was, even in those days, you know, you could see the potential of a leader in him. Near death with tuberculosis in his final year at Hilltown, Robert Sobuke rallied to earn a first-class metric pass, which took him to the University of Fort Hare in 1947. He studied Latin as an additional non-degree subject, and his involvement in the ANC Youth League brought an increasing political consciousness. In his final year, he was unanimously elected as president of the SRC. Graduating with majors in English, Kosa, and so-called native administration, by 1949, Sobuko had made his mark as orator and student leader. He was a man of great intellect. I want to think that he's possibly one of the greatest thinkers that this country has produced. If you go right back to Fortier, he was not just an ordinary student, but he was a student leader. He was regarded as one of the top students. And uh, he was a man of analytic mind, always illustrating his point. He says, when you get into a room with a tap that is running over, 
and there's water in the house. You don't just stand there and hope that the tap will close down. You've got to take off your shoes, walk through the puddle of water, go to the tap, close it. And when you have closed it, then you can mop up the water. You don't start mopping up the water while the tap is running. This is one of the stories he told about uh, the centrality of the struggle, that the struggle is to stop apartheid legislation and then deal with the other things and not think that you can do it by merely trying to patch up, as it were. When I met him, he was already in politics. We met at Victoria Hospital. I was trained there as a nurse, and the nurses were on strike. And one of us was picked up as a ringleader. And we said, if he, she leaves, we are also going to leave. And we were expelled from our dormitories. And the Fortarians came to our rescue to give us blankets because it was cool. And the Fortarians used to come to our meetings. That's where I first met him. When I first saw him, I think my heart skipped a beat. It was love at first sight. After completing midwifery, I went to Fryhead. I was working as a trained nurse. He was teaching in Standerton General High School. I used to write to him and tell him that I'm passing Standerton to Devon or Fryhead or Ladysmith. And he used to come there and meet me. At Standerton Station, on my way to, to work, Subok was a great man. Subok was from Fort Hay when he taught us. Came there as a teacher. Bright young man, like sports, would talk to anyone, you know, calmly, happily. And he would like to group you now with the youth. Teach us, you know, rugby touch, soccer. He was a nice, soft man, quiet, wearing a smile all the time. Music, he liked music. I remember the one song now we used to sing in the class. Ayu sisi lom tumnyama e Africa. Long is it with his bear pants we now. Send in to one. What have we done? What is this guy support Africa? We are suffering in our own country. What is actually that we've done? What is our mistake to God? I remember some time back, these advisor reports, they met with the inspectors. Then travel started, they said, Sobo is going to leave Sanaton. He's not wanted there. We had news that he got politics at Fort Hare. So we groomed together as boys, we talked this out. Why can he take a good teacher from outside, teaching us dance, music? So there was that noise at school. Uh, they stopped, they left him. And that man was alright. Yes, this man can talk. In fact, I felt something in his spinal cord with me. Like, as if you only get music, you know, people are singing. You feel the spinal cord, you know, going down. Yeah, that was a great man. Why smoking his pipe, you know, happily smiling. We got married in 1954 in Johannesburg. I was teaching it. Wits University as a lecturer in Bantu languages. I first met him, and for some time after, uh, my assessment of him was that I was this very clever fellow, and he had these interesting ideas about politics, but I thought he was very much uh, a university academic, uh, with some of the faults of university academics. And I gradually saw him changing, and uh, two years later, this was a very different person, and I was enormously impressed when I heard him speak in meetings, because there was a strength about him. He was really developing because he was facing challenges in his own mind. He was having to face up to his responsibilities in wanting to be a political leader. At the same time, the political situation in this country was unfolding. The conflicts were going on in the ANC. The Africanists were developing as a separate force. And he was clearly emerging as the leader of the Africanists. The communal hall in Orlando was a setting for the watershed ANC conference in November 1958. 
which saw the Africanist part ways with the mother body. With the adoption of the Cliptown Charter in 1955, the Africanists were concerned that the ANC had discarded the 1949 program of action and that the direction and control of the movement was being manipulated by the Communist Party. The PAC was launched at the same venue the following year, in April 1959. By the end of the year, we were heading for the first national conference of the PAC in Orlando. And that was the second time that I really came across the man, Sobukwe, who was now the president for about nine months or so of the PAC. It was at that conference that one of the most important decisions was taken to challenge the past laws. I remember one single year, 1957, when as much as 368,000 Africans were arrested and charged under one aspect of the past laws or the other. A thousand people and more per day, every day on the average, that is what it meant. The law at that time provided that the commissioner of the police can sell cheap labor to the farmers, cheap labor to make more profits with convict labor. And Sovukwe saw all this. He understood it. It was his people who were suffering. And you see, the decision had to be taken. And no soft methods were now to be resorted to. And the PAC took a decision at that Congress under Sovukwe's leadership that we were going to take final decisive action against the past laws. And powers were given to Sobukwe to call the nation as soon as possible. And we were amazed at the simplicity of the plan. Sobukwe decided that on a given day, a local branch of the PAC, under the local leadership, would move to the nearest police station and say to those in charge of the police station, look, here we are. <laughs> we don't have our pass. The whole idea was that uh, you had to give non-violence a chance. That was Sobukwe's mission. The Reef area, Eastern Cape, uh, the Natal region were sufficiently mobilized, but I think the Western Cape was in the lead. And Sobukwe came around in February 1960s to say, folks, if you let me down, I remember, those are his last words, that last time I was on, if you guys let me down in the Western Cape, then we, we are nowhere. He had a sense of his audience. And here he knew he was talking to, you know, the migrant workers that come from the Eastern Cape to work in the dockyard, in the fishing industry and so on. Uh, Semi-illiterate men and women, traditionalists, who carry their big pipes and want to listen to the men who is coming to tell them a story about fighting the past laws. And in the traditional way, uh, Sobukwe would get onto the platform and say, in, in beautiful Tosa, I'm the son of Sobukwe, born in Hrafreinet, that country of the goat and the sheep. You know, you talk to the ordinary folks who realize this is not a township boy. He comes from the rural areas. For instance, he starts by talking about an African woman, somewhere in Central Africa, beautiful lady who had a little boy, we don't know who the father was, but this beautiful woman used to be visited by all types of men because they saw a charming woman. And a Portuguese guy stays, goes away. A British man comes, stays away. Another Spanish guy hangs around, goes away. But as the years goes by, the woman started losing her beauty and sometimes wears off. And later on, the number that comes around seems to be thinning down until one day when the woman is finished. I mean, to be talking about colonialism, imperialism, new colonial, what would it mean to the villagers? But a, a story like that would have this type of impact. In deciding to opt for politics to serve his people, it was a very strong belief in him. It came from deep inside him. And I saw him going through the tussle in his own soul about what to do, because Rhodes University offered him a full lectureship, and that was quite exceptional. And he could have very easily gone for the 
very nice option of being a university lecturer, which he enjoyed doing. He loved teaching, he loved writing and research, but he accepted his responsibility was to go on with politics and to serve his people. On Friday, 18th March, Sobukwe announced that the moment had come. The decisive non-violent campaign against the past laws would be launched in 72 hours. On the eve of March the 21st, Sobukwe tendered his resignation to the University of the Vedvatasarand. Circumstances have arisen, he wrote, which make it necessary in the interest of the university that I resign. I wish to thank you for the attitude you adopted in refusing to interest yourself in my political life. Yours sincerely, R.M. Sobukwe. The following morning, Sobukwe put into practice his call to the nation, and history took its course. So I ended up at the Orlando police station, and I was there, when Sobukwe went inside and knocked on the door of the officer commanding. And in pretty traditional white police style at that stage, the officer said, I'm busy, <laughs> I'll see you later. Then I heard at a place called Boffalong, the police had opened fire, and it was thought that at least two people had been killed. And I went across and told Tsubukwe, and he was profoundly disturbed by this. He had, remember, sent a letter on the Friday to the commissioner of police to tell him about the coming campaign and to ask him to ensure that the police remained non-violent. And then I decided to go and see what was happening at Buffalong, Everton, Sharpville, and I said goodbye to him and wished him well. I got to Sharpville, and the police evidence afterwards was of this threatening crowd. Uh, it just wasn't true, because I was in the thick of that crowd. And once they knew us from the Rand Daily Mail, uh, all that people wanted to do was to tell me their grievances. And suddenly the shots began. And um, Ian Berry, with the most extraordinary courage, took the pictures of people running towards him. And at first you see they're laughing. And then they realize what is happening and they're covering their heads with their shirts and so on. And then you just see the field of, of the dead. Sixty-nine people died in the hail of police gunfire at Sharpville that day. As the echo of the massacre awakened understanding of oppression in South Africa around the world, so too the last hopes for peaceful change faded in the settling dust at Sharpville. Non-violent struggle had failed. So Buke too was to pay the ultimate penalty with the South African government instituting the so-called Sobukwe laws, enabling the incarceration of Robert Sobukwe, as they put it, this side of eternity. On the 21st March 1960, Robert Sobukwe, President of the Pan-Africanist Congress, together with PAC leadership countrywide, set the example in their call for a decisive, non-violent campaign against the past laws. Leaving their past books at home, they walked to the nearest police station and demanded arrest. Sobukwe, initiator of the campaign, was arrested with 23 of the executive committee and held at the Johannesburg Fort, pending trial. Meanwhile, in the Western Cape, a week-long stay away intensified the campaign. At Langa, 
police responded brutally and history once more took its course. They moved into Langa. I think it was around 2 o'clock at night. And it was house to house beating up people. Now on that morning of the 30th of March, here was a situation which was presenting itself and the PAC, which was the initiator of the whole thing, decided that we are now not marching to any police station, but marching straight to parliament. And we led this column past Mowbray Station, up Deval Drive, past Khrodeskir, skirting Table Mountains, down into the street that goes straight into parliament. Because Cape Town had been almost stand still for a week, as we were streaming out of Langa, somebody came to me and said, look, SABC is announcing that you are marching into town, and the whole of the Western Cape hears that. So that by the time we reached town, the town was already filled with curious, interested people who just wanted to see what's going on. Unaware that the minister, F.C. Erasmus, had given the commissioner of the police for the Western Cape orders that we have to be shot that morning. And Parliament was sitting. And if Osana had lifted his little finger, that city could have been sacked that day. And they knew it. The government was in a state of absolute fear that day. And I'm telling you, we were damn determined. <laughs> and all that we wanted to talk to the commissioner of the police was that he should set up an appointment with Mr. F.C. Erasmus, the Minister of Justice. Well, they realized they can't move this crowd. 60,000 cramped into the city of Cape Town. After 30 minutes, they came back to say, Mr. Kosana, the minister has agreed to meet you this afternoon. Could you please remove this crowd from the city? And I want to believe that uh, sometimes little miracles do happen and that our people could stand inside the city of Cape Town for at least something like two hours without touching a glass or breaking anything. I asked for the police loudspeaker and just to tell the people that we have secured an appointment with the minister. And I reminded them what Sobukwe had said. When you have reached an agreement with the police, just obey what the police say. And that whole crowd moved back. It took time because people were exhausted. We reached Langa, I think, about 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And for me, we had reached the highest point of a non-violent struggle. Nothing more than that could ever happen in South Africa, in my view. And I knew that that appointment really meant nothing except now that I was going to go with a small group of people who would just be locked up. Philip Khosana was detained on that historic afternoon of March 30th, 1960, and whilst on bail, left South Africa for 36 years in exile. Robert Sobukwe, was sentenced on the 4th May 1960 to three years hard labor. Your worship, he said from the dock, we believe in one race only, the human race to which we all belong. The history of that race is a long struggle and we would have betrayed the human race if we had not done our share. We stand for equal rights for all individuals and are not afraid of the consequences. Having served his three-year sentence due for release, Sobuke was secretly flown to Robben Island on the 23rd April 1963. Sobuke was an educated man, a lecturer at Verz University. He would have enjoyed his life. And I think while Sobuke was in the hands of this man, they discovered the depth of the man. They were also obviously impressed by his integrity by his charisma, a very quiet person, almost professorial, but people responded to him. And they were determined not to let him have any influence again. Resolute in their determination to neutralize the influence of Robert Sobukwe on the South African majority, the government passed a bill through parliament, the so-called Sobukwe Clause, which enabled them to detain Robert Sobukwe a year at a time indefinitely, in isolation and without trial on Robben Island. I only knew him starting when we went to visit him at uh, Robben Island. At the time, I didn't know whom we were going to visit. I didn't know that I had a father for that matter. I think I was around six. We'll stay together with him 
for the entire two weeks. Spending mornings, afternoons and evenings confined inside that, uh, that place of his. There was no living soul never around him. He used to point further afield that that's where the maximum prison is located. He was kept under solitary confinement for the duration of his stay there. If that's not suffering, I don't know how would you, you term that. I was just happy when I was around him, even though we didn't talk much. You know. We didn't talk much. He was a person who never complained. He just accepted everything. We were just proud of him. Benji was a great friend of my husband. In fact, he was just like a brother to him. He supported him spiritually. And as he came to see us almost every month, he was very supportive. Once he was on the island, I applied for permission to go and see him. And I think my request coincided with what the government was interested in, was they were very anxious to know what his thinking was. And we had six days together. And I would go to the island and we'd go to an interview room and we'd sit at a table all day long talking. And it was clear he hadn't changed. He was as determined, as certain as ever about where he'd been and where he wanted to go. And he went on talking in these terms, knowing that the place was almost certainly bugged. And that gave them all the answer they needed clearly, that this was a man who in their terms was incorrigible, <laughs> in his terms remained committed to the cause of freedom and was not going to deviate. And we knew as we talked that he was certainly consigning himself to continued imprisonment. And then we heard that what has told us the old leader is here. And then we were very anxious to see him. Following day when we were taken to work, we were pulling bamboo out of the sea. We passed that house and we saw him, we knew him. It was, he took up the ground and, 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 and spread it for us. And then we saluted him, our salute. And then we were sure that it was him. And every time we passed, it was such a delight whilst it was heavy, but going past his cottage, we would see him there. And I guess out of boredom, he would want always to be present when we go past in the morning and evening. And we'd all do the salute for him. That is it. And he inspired us. And you'd always raise, get to the ground and take sand and drop it down like, you know, like this going f slowly to mean is related, this is our land. I would be writing letters asking about his needs and he would be replying because he was on his own, he was wearing his own clothing, he wanted to study, he was allowed to get books, uh, which was censored of course, and I gradually tried to push things as much as possible to try and make life as reasonable for him as could be done in the circumstances. I'd buy clothing for him and uh, we would have some joking references to it that uh, he would say when I bought him underwear that he preferred white underwear and I wasn't to take this amiss. This wasn't a statement about his political preferences or anything like that, um, but that's just the way it was. There was a time there I to get a little bit too over ambitious and I remember one time I said, uh, could I send a little carpet for the floor and perhaps I could get him a more comfortable chair. And he wrote back rather sternly to say there was a limit to what he wanted because it was important for him to remember always that he was in prison. The routine was a bit difficult because he never knew when breakfast was being brought to him and so it might be at six, might be at seven, might be at eight in the morning. So you can never be sure when his day was starting. But he would have his breakfast, he liked to listen to the religious program on the SABC and he would settle down to work. He was doing a university degree, did several degrees on the island and he would read and listen to music and pass the day as constructively as possible. He fought against the despair, obviously. 
I was leading a pretty hectic bachelor's life, and I think Veronica used to tell him about this when she visited him, and he was very disapproving. Uh, there was a strong moral streak to Bob, and uh, he referred to my skirt world very disapprovingly. And uh, he treated me like a younger brother, uh, who had to be kept in line and chastised and pointed in the right direction. And I treated him like an older brother. And uh, it was a very close and very loving relationship. Robin Island Jail, Robin Island. My dear Benji, I'm always happy to receive a letter from you, probably because I can hear your voice behind the words. I'm sorry that the authorities will not allow you to come and see me again. It would be quite an occasion. I can still see you arriving in 1964 when you suggested that I sit more in the sun, from which day dates my association with the tree outside. Very best wishes, old man. Yours affectionately, Bob. What eventually happened, he'd been on the island for six years in these quite terrible circumstances, never knowing when he was going to come out. Could have gone on indefinitely. And it began to erode him. And there was clearly something wrong. And I think the government suddenly realized that they had a problem on their hands and they dumped him quick as a flash. Put him into banishment in Kimberley. Banished to the township of Khalishiwe outside Kimberley on 14th May 1969, Robert Sobugwe, restricted to house arrest from 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning, studied law and in 1975 was admitted to the bar. His practice once proudly stood where today remains the Batu Cafe. In the evening, Robert Sobuka came home to his wife and four children, Miliso, Tinile Sizwe, Tetani Zizwe, and Dalinje Ebo. We are now staying as a family. He was a strict disciplinarian. Yeah. We woke up early in the morning, make tea. We used to take turns. Others would be outside watering the garden. We were never idle. Politics was taboo at home after his release. But even Mama couldn't stop him. Whenever he, was, he had visitors, you know, old friends, he would start uh, chattering about, you know, the old times. I used to go down to Kimberley, and we used to sit and talk, and uh, 50 feet away, the security police would be in their car, just sitting there watching us all the time. And one of my great regrets is I never taped his voice. I was too scared that if I taped him, and they would probably had listening devices anyway, which we accepted they had, that they would jump us. And the late Steve Biko uh, contravened these bannings, uh, possibly once, perhaps twice, to go across country to see Sabuque, and that would have been an illegal meeting. He wasn't trying to arouse the population, but his presence was important there. The mere fact that he was there and people knew he was there contributed to the politicization of the community in Galashewe. On the other hand, lots of people from all over the world came to meet him. We've had leading figures from the various governments. We've had people from Europe. We've had people from the United States. Paul oh, Malumi was modest. He was a humble man. There are a lot of good things we picked up from him. He never raised his voice when talking. He always had a smile, which surprised us, like someone who was from jail. I remember when Malume went to the Methodist church in number two location, all of us were surprised. Are these people not communists? Then when we saw Malume singing and moving when everybody was singing, the whole location was humbled by his humbleness, everybody loved him. And uh, whenever the church was full, Malume would stand up. He would never allow a lady to stand up. When he was off duty, he looked so handsome in his khaki attire. Working in his garden, we, was, we, we used to stand up and marvel at this wonderful, but what type of a man is this? Such a well-learned man, such a brave man but oh, so humble. To me, Malume's faults were, he smoked a lot. He was a chain smoker. And his weakness again was, he didn't get a good salary, 
But now and then, you could see him giving people money. Then we used to tell him, no, Malume, don't do it. To me, those were his weaknesses. Uh, Robert was a people's person. He was the type of person who felt absolutely no hatred for anybody. He always, always just saw the good in people. He would come home in the afternoons from court. Our shoe store was across the road from the magistrate court, and he'd find a woman crossing the road, and he'd get hold of a bag of potatoes or whatever parcel she was carrying, sling it over his shoulder with his briefcase in one hand and his gown over the other arm, and he'd help her across the road. That was Robert. It was quite clear that it was a police vehicle. It had a puncture. And he just moved into the crowd. The crowd was more or less hostile towards the police. And they were taunting the police, and they were not helping the police. The police didn't have a jack to jack up the van. So he went straight there, saw what the problem was, and he lifted the car with, uh, with other, gave them assistance to lift the car, and another policeman removed the wheel and put in another wheel. And that hostility of the crowd changed. And I didn't like what he was doing. And I said, why? I remember, I was just fresh from prison. Why does he, my leader, does he do this, help the system? And I said, Prof, why do you do that? Why do you help these dogs? And then he said something very remarkable. He said, Joe, you know what? You call them dogs. But if you want to change them, you must give them love. The phrase that always resounded in my mind when I would think of him was the one from Chaucer, a gentle path at night. This enormously gentle, courteous person, we'd walk through the streets of Kimberley and there were always greetings for him and he would politely greet everyone, didn't matter who they were, he would greet them. I was also very amused and struck by his experience at the bank where he had an account because he told me with some irritation that there was a young white clerk who persisted in addressing him as Robert. And uh, Bob let this happen for a while, and then one day he said very quietly to the fellow, uh, we haven't been introduced, why do you call me Robert? And he said the clerk uh, uh, was embarrassed and blushed and apologised, and thereafter called him Mr. Sabukwe. And that was his style of dealing with things. It's a very gentle, quiet way of doing it, but very firm. He knew, you know, where, where the line was, and that was all there was to it. I asked him the reasons for the split in ANC, whether there were any differences between the two movements. He only said that was a, a good question I asked. But then we'll get ample opportunity to discuss this at length. That opportunity never materialized. Uh, there was not enough time. There was not enough time. He never accepted that he was dying. My wife Anne and I went down and we spent a Saturday with him in his room and we talked quietly and then he'd sleep again. And there was one remarkable moment when a priest came in. He was coloured, and I was standing on one side of the bed holding Bob's hand. And also in the room at that time, there was a black woman and an Asian man. And the priest prayed. And uh, it was very much the South Africa one would want to see. It was quite an extraordinary moment. And Bob simply laid there as the priest was praying, and he kept saying, Amen, Amen. And he told me uh, he didn't believe he was going to die, that he had a destiny to fulfill, and God would ensure that he fulfilled that destiny. And um, by the end of the day, he was a lot better. And we went back to Johannesburg the next day after coming in to see him again, and he looked a lot better, and we thought he'd come through that crisis. But um, less than a week later, at about two in the morning, Veronica phoned me to say he'd died. In 77, I'd gone abroad to join 
my elder brother and my sister who were in America at the time. Then the following year, that's when we had the sad news that he had passed away. His last words was just a strong handshake, asking me to keep well, to be serious in my studies. He was a very humble man. People used to love him. And I can't say it's because he was intelligent. He used to tell me that, don't say so much about your husband, Zoto. <laughs> so I won't say too much about him. I won't praise him now. The people will praise him, not me. It was as if there was a dark cloud in Kimberley. All of us were asking God, why now? When we thought, here comes light for Kimberley, then all of a sudden, it was dim. A lot of people prepared Malume's funeral, but I tell you, it was painful. The whole of Kimberley went over to Hrathreinet. On the 27th February 1978, Robert Sobukwe, at the age of 53, died of lung cancer. Tragically, he did not live to see the abolishment of the past laws in 1986, nor the dawning of democracy in April 1994, the cause for which he committed his life. Tragic most of all, the laws for South Africa denied the contribution of Robert Mangaliso Sobuukwe. True leadership, he wrote, demands complete subjugation of self, absolute honesty, integrity and uprightness of character, and above all, a consuming love for one's people. 